One of the lamest pieces of criticism that I've heard parroted on social media and among paid film critics is that the 1979 James Bond movie Moonraker was just a commercial attempt to cash in on the success of Star Wars in 1977. This ape-level interpretation is based on the two-year gap between the two movies and the fact that they both have scenes set in space. It ignores many contradictory factors, such as the first three quarters of Moonraker's runtime not even taking place in space at all. To my knowledge, there are no direct references to Star Wars in Moonraker, but there is a direct reference to Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind in the form of a key code melody. But one of the biggest elements that blows the Star Wars rip-off interpretation out of the water is that Moonraker has a lot more in common with Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and in places this comparison narrows down to some very specific details. For example, a floating zero-gravity pen being grabbed mid-air by a character. I can't think of this happening in any other movie besides Moonraker in 2001. I don't think I've ever seen it in any other context. In the novelization of Moonraker, which was written as the film was being produced and thus includes scenes and details that didn't make the final cut of the film, Bond picks up a bottle of wine on Drax's station and reads the label. He says, Kubrick, 2001, excellent year. He doesn't say, George Lucas, 1977, excellent year. The parallels between Moonraker and 2001 begin with their production histories. Both movies had NASA providing technical assistance to try and give a sense of realism to the technology involved in space travel. NASA are thanked for this in Moonraker's credits, and NASA technical staff were interviewed about their roles on the set of 2001 A Space Odyssey. The NASA influence results in the spacecraft exterior and interior scenes for both of these movies having a convincing impression of functionality rather than the artistically free-form designs of technology seen in Star Wars and most other sci-fi movies. Unlike Star Wars, both these movies involve a great emphasis on zero gravity and the use of spinning centrifuges to create artificial gravity. Not that it's totally convincing in either case, both movies have their blatant gravity errors, and the biggest in 2001 is the council meeting, which is supposedly on the moon, but it has full gravity equivalent to Earth's. But the effort is there in these two movies to portray zero gravity far more than it is in most other science fiction films. In 2001, Velcro shoes and floors are used to create artificial gravity in some sequences by having astronauts' shoes stick to the floor. And that appears to be the case in these sets of Moonraker as well. Orbital communicator, level 10, zero gravity. Once they start fighting in these sets though, it's obviously just normal gravity. I'm not aware of any other space movies that have this Velcro grip shoe element, at least none from the time. Moonraker and 2001 both have slow, majestic space flights, accompanied by glorious and uplifting music. This slowness in both cases hints at the precision required to manoeuvre in the vacuum of space, and it's in stark contrast to the fast space flights in Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica and the rest of those 70s space movies, Alien being the only example I can recall which, which matches up with this slow sequences of space travel. However, Moonraker does avoid 2001's unique depiction of silence in the vacuum of space. Rocket thrusters, lasers and explosions can all be heard in space in Moonraker. But then that's the case in near enough every science fiction movie set in space anyway. Family orientated sci-fi movies do this to keep up cinematic drama in traditional form which relies on sound effects as well as music and visuals. 2001 Space Odyssey is fairly unique in its depiction of the vacuum of space being totally silent. But this isn't to say that Moonraker is shamelessly commercial though. As explored in great detail in my video Totalitarianism Themes in Moonraker and Dr. Strangelove, Moonraker is, in large part, an adaptation of Dr. Strangelove into the James Bond cinematic universe. But Moonraker also shares 2001's warnings about the false allure of technology. Here, for example, Bond is led underground to a false paradise with technology on the other side of this metal bridge. 
and lots of women standing around with angels singing and the music to make it all seem very alluring. But Bond refuses to cross that bridge. In 2001, the first spaceflight scenes are full of uplifting music and are brightly lit, like a PR promotion of space travel technology. But this is reversed in the final spaceflight scene near Jupiter. Space is now depicted visually and in the score as a vast, terrifying dark place. In Moonraker, the initial flight sequence is also full of glorious and uplifting music, including angels singing. But this later becomes a murderous space battle, with guys getting their breathing tubes severed and hailing off into the endless void. The angels continue to sing on the score in what comes off to me as a deliberately ironic contradiction. The technological dream has gone sour. This all interestingly ties in with the funding motives of these two movies. NASA got heavily involved in the production of 2001 A Space Odyssey as a means of promoting their efforts at landing on the moon in 1969. The movie was released a year earlier and includes a flight to the moon, and it's all presented like a big TV commercial. Likewise, NASA was preparing the first of its shuttle launches while giving technical advice to the Moonraker production. Moonraker was released in 1979, and the first NASA shuttle was launched in 1981. So the movie promoted those shuttle launches as they were being developed. In fact, it was the very first movie to feature NASA shuttles, and they did a great job of it. The movie even identifies the Vandenberg launch site from which the real space shuttles would be launched later. TDRSS reports a launch, sir. Continental USA. Vandenberg. Despite Moonraker not actually taking its audience to the moon like 2001 did, it does slip in a couple of full moon shots. And as an example of NASA staff retaining a certain affinity for the Moonraker film, in 2009 they developed this project to design an excavation robot for use on the moon, and they titled the project Moonraker. Despite the pro-space race assistance from NASA and other tech corporations, Kubrick took his movie off in bizarre directions that contradicted the space race message. See my video, Horror of the Void, for a detailed study of how 2001 shatters the illusion of mankind being able to colonise space in any hurry. I mean, here we are in 2021, two decades after the movie's setting, and the massive space stations and moon bases promised in the movie still haven't come to fruition, and there's not a sign of it happening in any hurry either. Also, the movie's depiction of human-level artificial intelligence in the form of HAL hasn't happened either, and might never happen. Despite these failed promises in the narrative, 2001 The Movie lives on as a deeper philosophical statement of its own, separate from the funding from NASA. These days the battle between mankind and the danger of technology, represented by the battle between Dave Bowman and Hal, this is the more widely talked about theme today. Even back in 1968 when the film was shown to investors, IBM was so annoyed with this plot element that they asked Kubrick to remove their prominent logo from the film sets. But Kubrick left their logo in in certain key moments, and with meaning. Kubrick had also very subtly put across the notion of the space race being underpinned by military motives. He did this by presenting various nuclear-armed spacecraft orbiting the Earth, but the film doesn't tell us that these vessels have nukes. Instead, Kubrick gives us clues such as the bone symbol on this spaceship, right after we've just seen bones being used by apes to smash each other's heads in, and of course the throne bone, which is a weapon, turns into a satellite, a nuclear satellite weapon. Different country flags on the nuclear satellites as well, and the novelization reveals that when the star child returns to Earth, it destroys these orbiting nuclear stations. And Kubrick explained in one interview that he didn't have that ending in the film because he didn't want to repeat the ending of Dr. Strangelove. 
In short, Kubrick made the film he wanted to make instead of just selling out for a slice of the space race money pot. Moonraker is equally interesting in terms of conveying ideas that contradict the space race funding motive. This time, space warfare is directly presented as troops shooting each other in a zero-gravity battlefield, a continuation of the senseless battlefield killing that has occurred on Earth's soil for centuries. But NASA would have known from the script that this would be present in the film, so they must have accepted and approved of the scene. After all, it's a James Bond movie, there's going to be action scenes in it. But it wasn't just NASA. The first special thanks in the credits goes to Rockwell International Space Division. NASA is listed second. And then special thanks is given to the US Air Force and US Marine Corps, military departments of government. Why would they get special thanks? They must have provided either technical assistance of some kind or funding. Rockwell International, according to its wiki page, developed various types of rocket thrusters. They also built the early space shuttles, but there's a wiki section for missile development that is empty for some reason. A quick bit of online searching brings up multiple sources confirming that Rockwell International did in fact apply itself to the development of missile weapons. Funnily enough, the company closed in 2001. Given the special thanks to military-related sources in Moonraker's credits, I think it's a safe bet that the film wasn't just supported by these organisations to promote space exploration itself. It was promoting the potential applications for military defence as part of the PR package. And so, a space shuttle intercepts Drax's space station and ruins his plan. Then Bond and Holly use a space shuttle to chase and destroy the projectiles that are on their way to kill hundreds of millions of people on Earth. Space race technology saves the day, and the moment is celebrated by bureaucracy sitting with pictures of space shuttles behind them. But, and here's a contradiction that smacks of Kubrickian counter-propaganda, the villainous Drax Corporation in the movie has a logo that is extremely similar to the Rockwell International logo, the one that they were using in real life. Rockwell International was a privately owned technology venture, as is Drax Industries in the movie, and Drax runs his operation from California, American soil. So who does Drax represent? Is he intentionally paralleled with Rockwell International? That would be quite a statement against an investor. The NASA Space Shuttle program had this logo, which has a similar blast-off motif to the Rockwell logo, but it's framed within a tapered triangle. Today, NASA uses this as one of its symbols as well, which has a similar tapered design. So, in what might be an intended parallel with the Space Shuttle logo of the time, Drax's shuttle takes off from within Mayan pyramid ruins in South America. Even the control room within that pyramid features the tapered triangle design. And this part of the movie has a general emphasis on Mayan symbols, as if Drax and his followers are the Mayans reincarnated, along with their self-destructive flaws. Drax himself is near enough equivalent to HAL 9000 in 2001 each of them giving an initial aura of sophistication, but turning out to have a superiority complex and being murderous. Drax sending nerve gas projectiles to wipe out people on Earth, Hal killing people in their sleep by switching off their life support. Likewise, Bowman, who defeats Hal, and Bond, who defeats Drax, they have similarities too. James Bond has always been virtually a Superman character, and Bowman is reborn as the Superman star child. Bowman drinks wine as part of his victory in a room where his technological dependencies gradually disappear. And as I said earlier, Bond finds a Kubrick 2001 wine brand on the space station. That's in the novelization. In the movie, it's Jaws who drinks a bottle of Bollinger champagne instead, Bond's favourite brand, and that's after he converts and helps defeat Drax. Drax's followers generally are presented as equivalent to rats or mice in a lab. With no personality on display whatsoever, typical of cult followers, they move through tubes like mice, just as in 2001 A Space Odyssey, Frank Poole runs around a wheel endlessly, like a caged mouse. James Bond, being of sound mind, sees Drax for what he is from the outset of the movie, and he eventually disposes of this technocrat with a line that I'm sure Kubrick would have approved of. Take a giant step for mankind. 
Let's finish off here with a bit more examination of the sets. These docking bay sets between the two movies are strangely similar. Look at the windowed technician rooms on either side and the symmetry. I've not been able to find any real world shuttle launches depicting this kind of setup. They always seem to take off from exterior launch pads. The interior of HAL features odd streaks of disjointed light and Drax's space station centre features disjointed streaks of light around its ceiling. Now you may think I'm clutching at straws seeing these kinds of connections, and yes I could be. But set designer Ken Adam, who did the sets for Moonraker and many other Bond films, he had already worked directly with Kubrick on Doctor Strangelove in 1964 and on Barry Lyndon in 1975. In fact, some reports that I've read online claim that Kubrick wanted Ken Adam to do 2001 A Space Odyssey, but he wasn't available. Nevertheless, Adam and Kubrick knew each other well and influenced each other a great deal. Kubrick liked Adam's sets for the first Bond movie Doctor No, and he asked Adam to incorporate those same elements into the Doctor Strangelove sets. Likewise, Adam included elements of the war room's angled display screens into Moonraker. And this boardroom planning centre is very reminiscent of the war room table in Doctor Strangelove. So I wonder how many more details in these Moonraker sets carry conscious or subconscious parallels with 2001. For example, the ridged exits for the poisonous globe being similar to the presence of Hal's eye on the murderous pod here. However, there is something that carries potential parallel with Star Wars designs too. In Star Wars, a planet-destroying spherical space station was called the Death Star. In Moonraker, Drax's station has, at its centre, a spherical portion from which Drax gives his speeches and carries out his operation to kill all human life on Earth. So it's almost like a little mini Death Star, isn't it? In both films, the station attacks a planet and ends up getting destroyed itself. Final set decor point before we finish. I don't know enough about decor to be specific on this one, but I wondered whether the decor of the 2001 room in which Bowman makes his final transformation is intentionally paralleled by the lavish decor of some of Drax's abodes in Moonraker. Seems a bit far out, doesn't it? But, several films later, the Bond movie makers included one of the paintings from 2001's ending in this set from the final Roger Moore Bond movie, A View to a Kill. Isn't that strange? How specific? I've never been able to find this specific painting. I don't even know what it's called or who it's by. But there it is in a Bond movie, just like it was there in 2001. So with all this in mind, I'm sure you'll agree by now that Moonraker is a lot more than a mere Star Wars cash-in. The filmmakers had taken a leaf from Kubrick's work and made a movie that ties in deeply with both 2001 A Space Odyssey and Doctor Strangelove. Thanks for watching folks. If you want more, I've just put on sale on my website today various discount sets containing multiple paywall videos so you can get them all at a much lower price. So make sure to grab them while they're available. The link is in the video description below. You can also get access to lots of extra material of mine by supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching folks. Bye bye.